Hello and welcome to Horror Court Trash Over, the show that discusses all the masterpieces and trash to pieces of genre cinema. My name's Chris. And I am Joan Crawford. I forbid you slagging me off for the next hour and a half. Uh, and I'm Gary, and it's a good job we're not going to do that anyway. Because we're not. We love Joan. The we spirit do. of Joan, everyone. She was only here for a few seconds. <laughs> it was a perfect impression. It was actually fade done away. Well... I'm uh, pretty sure everyone's impression of Joan Crawford now is Faye Dunaway. Um, but Spot yes. on for this film, though. Of she, course. I'm, she actually looks like her in this film, but we'll, we'll get to that. Yes, yes. Welcome to week two of Hagsploitation Month here on the Horror Court Trash of a podcast. Yes. Um, we've got another absolute corker for you this week. But first of all, let's discuss what's new with Chris and Gary. Yes. Uh, this might be the first time where I've got two bests and you have a best and a worst. Yeah, yeah, there's been a lot of rewatches for you this there has, week, hasn't there? There has. Uh, for my first time watches, my best of is The Magic Flute. What can I say? Apparently, I'm an opera gay. Oh? Who knew? Are there opera gays? If there are, I'm, I might be the first of our kind. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, Ingmar Bergman, um... Just, just can't do no wrong. I mean, every film I've watched of his has been five stars, and this is no exception. It's just blurs the line between stage production and film. Uh, it's just so cinematic and crazy to think this is all on a stage. Yeah, it yeah. has that signature Bergman look about it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's Mozart's work essentially, but it's you can't mistake it for being a Bergman film. No, no. Um, I completely agree. That was my uh, best of the week as well. I thought it was absolutely beautiful. Um, exceptional filmmaking and uh, exceptional performances as well. Yeah. I'm, I, I don't, I'm not an expert at opera. I, I'm not. So my reference points aren't plentiful or, or anything like that. But I thought they sounded fantastic. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely. Not, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not able to judge, but to me, in my ears, it sounded great. So I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, my second best mm-hmm. is Twin Warriors, aka Tai Chi Master. Yes, it's Jet Li and Michelle Yeoh just doing their thing and. Creating a very entertaining film in the process. It's just a uh, sort of screwball comedy that Asian cinema does the best. Uh, mixed with some fantastic action scenes and stunning choreography, stunning cinematography. It's, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, really, really enjoyed that. Um, any other week, obviously, if we hadn't watched a Bergman classic, um, it would have been top choice because I, I thought it was really really enjoyable it's the kind of entertainment that i appreciate action-packed uh doesn't waste a second um was it always the most hilarious film no so, you know some some jokes don't age too well but um i thought it was great had a very very fun time with it my worst of the week would be Drum roll, please, from Gary. <laughs> no, uh, you're well aware. It's Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Seven-year-old me is disgusted. Um, we have made our way mostly through, we're not quite there yet, the Planet of the Apes films, mm-hmm. which Gary has a long history with. I do. And I have no history with, apart from the very first film, on the Tim Burton remake, but uh, we didn't watch that. Um, I'd seen the very first film, five stars, wonderful, all-time classic, brilliant, everything that everyone's ever said it is. The sequels, hit and miss. Uh Uh-huh. This was a fucking miss. (laughs) I've never known a franchise to jump the shark from the (laughs) get-go. I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea why Charlton Heston seemingly just didn't have enough time in his schedule. Like, it, like, had a day. So I'll give you a day. So just make up some shit around the fact that I can't be in the <laughs> film. Um, Whilst casting an actor that looked exactly yes. like him. 
um, who followed it. I, let's not get too much into it. <laughs> um, I was very confused. Um, it felt really dark in places and very violent. For, like, so is the no whole reason. franchise, though. I but, mean, I didn't realise that as a kid, but a lot of the themes went over my head. But this had weird aliens. Hey, they're mutants, not aliens. Uh, mutants, or whatever they were, um, who looked kind of campy, <laughs> and then worshipped an atomic bomb. And it's like, that's very dark for what is essentially some Star Trek one-episode villains <laughs> of some sort. And then, yeah, really quite violent as well. And it's just, I, I did not appreciate it whatsoever. Um, I will give shout-outs to Escape from the Planet of the Apes, though, and Conquest of the Planet of the yeah. Apes. Uh, clearly, to be a good Planet of the Apes film, you have to have Malcolm McDowell. Roddy McDowell. Roddy McDowell. Fuck me. Why you used to mock me all that? the time for making that mistake, and now the time. tables are turned. Bitch. All the time. Why Malcolm McDowell? Because he looks like he should be in Planet of the Apes. But why not Andy McDowell? No offense, McDowell. Malcolm McDowell. I am a homosexual. Yeah, but, I should be saying Andy McDowell. But McDowell. Malcolm McDowell has the face for Planet of the Apes. <laughs> it's a miracle that he hasn't been cast. But excuse me, because I love Malcolm McDowell as well. And he was, by all accounts, on our team. So I should show some appreciation. Yeah, you do love Roddy McDowell Roddy as well. Roddy McDowell. Oh, I'm done. You fucking I'm did done. it again. I, I keep doing it. I have no idea why. So is Malcolm McDowell on our team? He wasn't Gossip Girl. No, he wasn't, was he? he? He was the last word said in Reboot or Gossip Girl. Oh, he wasn't gay in... Uh, no, but he was in it. Girl. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. But yeah, Roddy McDowell's great. Kim Roddy Hunter, McDowell. Kim Hunter is fantastic. Kim and, Hunter, fabulous. Yeah, Escape is my favourite of the original franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, but the new ones blow them out of the water. Which, I, I as a kid, I never thought I'd ever say that about anything about Planet of the Apes that wasn't the original films. But, I, yeah. It's amazing what you can do with a budget and modern technology. Yeah, I watched Rise of the Planet of the Apes for the first time and really appreciated it. It was good. Yeah. Yeah, so, and apparently it gets better. So it does. I'm quite excited it does. for that. Speaking of rising the planets, now I've got nothing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of, um, <laughs> I've got nothing. Else. Speaking of rise of a powerful being. Spe- speaking of playing it straight and Gossip Girl, this <laughs> straight jacket. Yes, it is. Um, yes, this week's Hagsploitation classic straight jacket. We will be discussing it in full. Spoiler warning: If you have not seen the film, there is a delicious twist. Yes. A delightful twist. A camp twist. If you have not seen the film, if you do not know the twist, then do not listen. Yeah. Go and watch the film. It might be on YouTube. Or it might not be. It's not. Oh, it's, it's not. not. No, no. Oh, it's, shit. Okay. um, it, yeah, you can get it in, on Indicator, though. Indicator Blu-ray. Yes. Um, yes. And, yeah, I mean, as Joan will tell you herself in the trailer that we'll play a little later... Watch it from the start. Watch yes. it from the start. Do not, uh, yeah, the, the whole psycho spiel. Um, but yes, straight jacket. I think Joan Crawford was just like that anyway. Do not be late yeah. for my film. <laughs> straight jacket from 1964, uh, one of William Castle's best. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I would say, depending on the day, William Castle's actual best. Yeah, it's from. It's one close. Of, yeah. From one of my um, favourite subgenres, which is uh, Bad Girls Thriving with Axes. Yeah. <laughs> I-, I won't ask you to name any of us because I'll spoil it for later. Pearl. Um, <laughs> any of us? Uh, so, Pearl. There is also, obviously, Axe, which we haven't seen, but I'm sure it'll be a favourite. <laughs> Cherry the, Falls. The. Uh, this might be a little spoiler for Urban Legend, um, but Urban Legend, the first Urban kills Legend, with an axe. Urban Legend. Um, yeah, do you know what? To be honest, I can't name that many. But still, it's. Uh, I'm sure it's a great genre. Oh, Lisa Frankenstein. Oh, she's got an axe in she's that. She's got an axe in nice. that. Um, 
Uh, yeah, no, I've, I've fucked upon this. I thought of two films, basically. Uh, and now I can't name any more. But don't judge me. Um, it was actually leading to a point I was going to make, anyway. Go on, then. Uh, and that is the fact that this film, uh, quite conveniently, with what we're discussing next week, we're going to be discussing X, this film definitely played a part in influencing Pearl. And there are so many similarities in there. There's even a poster that someone designed modeled after the straight jacket poster mm. um and just like even the way that mia goth carries the axe in the film and everything there's definitely there's so many parallels and uh we love to see it we do love to see bad girls with axes thriving <laughs> oh two of them yeah <laughs> uh this is directed by william castle uh, you did house on haunted hill 13 ghosts homicidal i saw what you did tingler 13 Frightened Girls, Sardonicus, and more. Of course, we did a full episode on William Castle. Go back and listen to it. Uh, He said in his biography that Joan Crawford was not difficult at all to work with, only a real perfectionist. And it was the best experience of his life. However, he could not resist using the sort of gimmick for this film that he always did for his other films. And at cinemas, he gave out cardboard axes streaked with simulated blood. Yes. And of course... Iconically, she also, Joan Crawford, as portrayed by Jessica Lange in Feud, um, would go out to cinemas to promote the film and uh, because she had a financial interest, Mm. she would go on a several city tour, making personal appearances, um, running through the cinema with with the axe. Yes, yes. Uh, It was reported she received, was it 15 to 20% of the film's profits as part of her contract? Yes, she did. So she had a very much a vested interest Uh in the film doing well. Um, And William Castle, as I've said many times on the podcast, was a marketing genius. He was. And it it worked. We'll get to that part in, in in a minute. But yeah, Joan Crawford... Took herself very seriously, but took her work very mm-hmm. seriously. Even even someone like Betty Davis, who didn't like Joan Crawford, yeah. would would always say that she was a professional and she was a perfectionist. Mm-hmm. And again, so I don't want to get too much into, because we haven't got enough time, but if Joan Crawford was a man, if it was Gregory oh, yeah. Peck out yeah. there, who was a perfectionist and wanted everything done, you know, as he saw it, there wouldn't be an issue. No one would be, you know, being bitchy about Gregory Peck, the perfectionist. But let's but face Joan it. Crawford would have a reputation as a woman who liked things done a particular way. Yeah, but let's face it, that probably was the case, but we don't know about it because he's a man. Yes, yeah, so, of course. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, it is it does reek of misogyny. But um, seemingly, William Castle is someone who actually appreciated yes. that. Oh, you're the star of the film. Oh, you're on time. Yeah, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Oh, you have a good idea, Joan. Okay, let let's have a look. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's a great idea. Thanks for thinking of that, Joan. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was written by Robert Block, who did the Psycho novel, mm-hmm. Star Trek, the Hunger TV series, Monsters, Tales from the Dark Side. Three Dangerous Ladies, The Dead Don't Die, not that one, The Cat Creature, and more. Um, so yeah, this heavy marketing part of this film was from the director of Homicidal, from the writer of Psycho, and the co-star of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Yes, yeah. So William Castle was a huge fan of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Yeah. Um, but originally Joan Blondell was meant to star. She was. Um, but it must have been a, a terrific coup for uh, William Castle to get John Crawf- uh, Crawford. Yeah. Um, because this film is probably quite influenced by what ever happened to Baby Jane anyway yeah. in terms of high exploitation. It was uh, an accident at her home that caused Joan Blondell to not star in the film. And Joan Blondell would be fantastic in this as yeah. well. Uh, an accomplished actress in her own right. Uh, Robert Block... Um, I feel like Psycho is revered, at least now, Mm -hmm. after all these years, as a film. Yeah. And I think Alfred Hitchcock helped. Yes. Um, I haven't read the novel, um, but it's not like Psycho, the novel is sort of within Mm -hmm. the hundred novels you must read. Yet Psycho, the film, 
is constantly in the hundred films you need to see before you yeah. die list. So, um, William Castle, I feel, was also a, a huge fan of Psycho, mm-hmm. um, and really wanted to recreate what Psycho did, yes. <laughs> particularly in Homicidal. So, um, yeah, great team put together. Yeah. And it worked because, I mean, it was made on a budget of $550,000 and it made $2.1 million worldwide. Uh-huh. Uh, and it was released in the UK in the lower half of the double bill with a Michael Winner film, The System. Okay. Love that we used to just have double bills for <laughs> cinema releases. I really... I, I mean, I suppose now we pay a fixed sum every month. Yeah. So we can have double bills whenever we That's like. True. That's Triple true. bills, quadruple bills. But it would have been nice to go and, and have mm-hmm. two films put together that they thought would make yeah. a good duo. And I, as somebody who doesn't drive and lives in the UK, I still have it quite high on my bucket list to go to a drive-in theatre. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that. We all know that Americana, that sort of aesthetic, that yeah, that thing. I love it, love it, love it, love it. Uh, thank you, Camila Bello. Um, so <laughs> as shocking as it is, uh, Straight Jacket is listed amongst the hundred most enjoyably bad movies ever made in the official Razzie Movie Guide. Razzies, really. Every time I mention them on this podcast, it proves more and more that it's so full of. Shit. Do you know what the Razzies don't understand? Camp. Camp. Yeah. Yeah, this is in no way a bad film. At all. No. Like, not even on a technical standpoint. There's only one bad performance in this film, and that adds to the enjoyment of the film when you find out why he's there. <laughs> yeah. uh, it could have been bad, though, because the original version of the script uh, with Joan Blondell involved a murderer who disguised herself by committing crimes whilst wearing an inflatable fat suit. Oh, no. Uh, and then, yeah, it was replaced before Joan replaced Oh, of course. Joan. I, I feel like Joan Blondell was um, larger. Yeah. A, a larger woman at, at the time. Should we talk about who's in it? Yes, in a section we like to call, hey, I know you. Not Joan Blondell. Not Joan Blondell. Uh, but no. Joan Crawford, of course, as Lucy Harbin, the star of, if you don't know by now, then what are you doing? But... <laughs> The star I feel like of... this is like the fifth time oh, we've gone through Joan Crawford's uh, filmography. You could do it for a change. Oh, shall I? So, Joan Crawford, star of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, Johnny Guitar, Oscar winner for Mildred Pierce, Grand Hotel, The Unknown, The Women, Sudden Fear, Possessed, Humoresque, so much more. I Saw What You Did, Berserk, Fabulous film, which we probably should cover in the future. And just so, so many, so many wonderful classic Hollywood films. Including Trog. A Trog, of course. Trog, previous podcast episode. When Christina Crawford's memoir, Mummy Dearest, caused an uproar about Joan Crawford's lack of parenting skills, sarcastic t-shirts were manufactured featuring the image of Crawford wielding an axe from this film... Above the words, Joe Craw- Joan Crawford Daycare Centre. If they're still being made, I will have one. <laughs> uh, as well as the Joan mask. I- I- I'd like the Joan mask from this film. <laughs> I would love the Joan the- mask from this film. Absolutely horrifying. Like, the scariest thing in this film is that uh, mask. It's so camp. So good. Like, re- I would actually read it. I'm assuming they made a few of them for these appearances. Yeah, I hope um, so. If if feud is to go by, um, and feud I think is you know uh, full of hearsay and, and, and such, yeah. but a great watch if no one's seen it. Uh, but there is a scene where John Waters is playing William Castle, and you know um, Joan's making her appearance and, and such. And there are other sort of extras, aren't there? There with is. Joan Crawford masks yeah. on. So I'm assuming quite a few were made. Um, I mean, looking now online, it doesn't. It looks like you can get the cardboard ones. Okay. But um, and the eye mask that you own. Yes. But not the uh, the straight jacket one. Um, oh, no. this exists though. If you'd like to try and describe this to our listeners, 
So that's a vintage original Joan Crawford Halloween <laughs> mask. Um, very well. I mean, the eyebrows are quite accurate. <laughs> very heavy on the eyeshadow. Uh, I don't think Joan's lips were that big. No. It's giving. Um, oh, I don't know. Actually, <laughs> it's hard to describe. Uh, I don't think her skin was green. Uh, no, like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of given Who Framed Roger Rabbit if Joan Crawford starred. Kind of, I wasn't the bad. Who was the bad? Um, the villain in Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> it's like someone has done it for Drag Race and they're going to get sent home that week. I would still own that. I would absolutely put that on my wall. Um, co-starring alongside Joan, we're well, trying to. Um, well, she's not out staging them. Diane Baker as Carol Cutler. She was in Marnie, Silence of the Lambs. Yes. Loved her suit in that. Loved her suit in The that. Prize. <laughs> Journey to the Centre of the Earth. The Cable Guy. The Nanny. Not that one. Murder at 1600. The Net. Murder She Wrote. And more. Yeah. Uh, so, a bit of a legend, Diane Baker. Very in much. Her own right. Very much. Um, she tries her best. She does. She does. And she does a good job. She's fighting a constant battle. But she's she gets eight up at every moment. Yeah. Thank God. So, I mean, someone has to be sacrificed to the Joan Crawford. Uh, it sounds like she had an absolute blast with yes. the Joan Crawford experience. Um, from the cold set to her purposely upstaging her. And it, <laughs> yeah. There's a very short documentary uh, the making of Straight Jacket is really worth watching, just for these stories alone. <laughs> Leif Erikson plays Bill Cutler. He was in The High Chaparral, On the Waterfront, Showboat, The Carpetbaggers, Invaders from Mars, previous podcast film, I Saw What You Did, previous podcast film, Twilight's Last Gleaming, Abduction, and more. Yeah, um, yeah, I... I only really remember him in Invaders from Mars. Don't remember him also what he did, but yeah, no, but he he's alright. Loves Star and Joan clearly. Good, good, good for him. And Howard yeah. St. John plays Raymond Fields. He was in Born Yesterday, Lil Abner, uh, Strangers on the Train, The Men, Sex and the Single Girl, Quick Before It Melts, Fate is the Hunter, Lover Come Back, and more. Yeah, yeah. He was also in Goodbye My Fancy, which I think is a little known. Uh, Joan Crawford film. So I'm getting, I'm getting she the hired feeling <laughs> that she had an opinion on who would be cast, yeah. and potentially having previously worked with them, and I assume getting on well with them, they got the job. Yeah. Um. I. I. Did you get George Kennedy? I didn't get George Kennedy. So George Kennedy as Leo Krauss, and I, I don't know how early this is. In his filmography, it's a fairly small role, and he would go on to uh, win the Oscar for uh, Cool Hand Luke, I believe, just a few years later. But he was in uh, the Naked Gun series of films, uh, Charade, Small Soldiers, uh, Death on the Nile, Creepshow 2, Just Before Dawn, and Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, amongst nice. others. So, yeah, he quite... Um, a small role for George Kennedy who went on to mm. quite big, big things. Yes. And that's, I think that's it, really, yeah. for uh, interesting people. No, not to say the others aren't interesting. but Well, in that case, let's talk about our feature presentation. This is Joan Crawford. I urge you to see my new motion picture straight jacket from the beginning. <laughs> Don't reveal the surprise shock ending. Don't reveal the surprise shock ending. Yes, so Lucy Harbin, Joan Crawford, has a solution for adultery and acts. Yes. So when she finds her husband in bed with his lover, it's off with their heads. And we open with a scream and a spinning newspaper. And apparently it's called spinning newspaper. I've, okay. I've Googled it many times. I felt like there might have been a fancy name for it. Spinning but newspaper. We, we all know the spinning newspaper flying at the screen and uh, it declares Lucy Harbin is a murderer. Extra, extra, read all about it. Love yes. Slayer insane. <laughs> we get a flashback with narration to the fateful night that Lucy became a murderer. <laughs> Unfortunately, Lucy's three-year-old daughter, Carol, witnesses the deed. 
And she's the one that's given us the narration much later on, not as a three-year-old, but much later on. So Lucy returns home early and sees them in bed through the window. And that's kids' camp. It's camp because (gasps) the woman can't move an inch without jangling her fucking bangles. (laughs) An extra credit in the film, Joan's bangles, also star of Jacqueline Wilson's wrists, author of Tracy Beaker. (laughs) Oh my god, they are jangling constantly in this film. It's amazing that you can hear anything else. It's true. And it's true. The it's... voiceover we get from is this actually Joan Crawford doing the voiceover? No, no, no. This like is it. this is Diane Baker. It's Diane Baker. This is Diane yeah, Baker. She's like Lucy Harbin, born and raised on the farm, parents poor, <laughs> education meager, very much a woman and very much aware of the fact. Yes. <laughs> so fucking camp and as a woman she she is jangling all the way she is coco chanel famously said before you leave the house take one thing off <laughs> lucy decided to put one extra bangle on before she did she, left the she house. did it's it's an iconic entrance the way she steps off the train with that classic joan crawford lighting on her face yes she looks drop dead gorgeous um the dress is to die for mm. It's a floral um, dress, yeah. isn't it? Uh, the hair, I like the hair. It's of its time. She looks like Faye Dunaway in Mummy she Dearest. Does. Like, she does. They got it spot on. She must have only looked at her from this film because that's what she looks like and that's what she talks like in yeah. that film. But the hair is kind of coiffed at the front. Yeah. It, it's almost like a fancy version of a mullet. Yeah. Because it's kind of coiffed at the front and then long and coiffed at the back. Um, but it's it's iconic. It's iconic. It's so iconic. It stays in fashion for twenty years. It does. As we'll find out. And I mean, fancy woman's got to have a fancy man. And her cheating lover is none other than uh, the four, the original fall guy himself, Lee Majors, in his feature film debut. Yes. Um, he got the part when his good friend Rock Hudson, good friend Rock Hudson. Asked William Castle to please find a job for this 23-year-old twin uh, actor. And uh, he adopted his stage name when he found out, because Lee Majors isn't his real name, uh, he got the name because Joan Crawford couldn't pronounce his real name. Harvey Lee Yeary. Oh. <laughs> so he's Lee Majors because of Joan Crawford. Of course, Joan Crawford could change my name whenever. <laughs> um, Lee Majors, I remember he was married to Farrah Fawcett. Yeah. She was Farrah Fawcett Majors for a long time. Farrah Fawcett, definitely friend of the gays. Uh, maybe. Uh, Likes to hide one. I would assume so. But... Good beard. <laughs> uh, but he's also obviously in Scrooge, Six Million Dollar Man, and so many more things. Went on to be a big star. And got to start here. Yeah, yeah. Um, quite an iconic scene. This, Just to preempt, I don't know if this was R-rated at the time. I'm assuming it was. I don't think it was. Here in the UK... Well, it's a 12. It's a 12. Um, but a lot of the film focuses on decapitations. The poster says, this film vividly depicts axe murders. Yeah. Um, and this is one or first of the film. The, the heads are cut off in silhouette against the wall before cutting to Lucy on a sh- um, in a straight jacket, screaming and protesting her innocence. It actually wasn't written in the US. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, here here now it's a twelve. Yeah, um, because obviously as as time goes by, things age, and what was shocking back then isn't so shocking now. I mean, one scene is. Yeah, but the effects are a little hokey, should we say? Which I believe adds to the charm. And, yes, it does. You know, um, but yeah, it, it's it's high camp. Um, Wearing that dress, yeah, looking the way she is, lifting that axe into the air. It's mm-hmm. oh, it's cinematic perfection. It really. It is. This is this is why I watch films. I I need this. This is lifeblood to me when I watch a film. Camp over the top, over exaggerated. You know every part of it: the dress, the bangles, the hair, the eyebrows. I just, I love it. Yeah. I love it. It's what I, I live for. We don't have enough fake heads being chopped off these Exactly. Days, and in silhouette as well, you know, come on. Uh, Lucy is tried and judged criminally insane. She spends the next 20 years at a mental institution. 
That's how long it takes for her to regain emotional stability. Upon her release, Lucy moves in with her brother and his wife on their farm. There, she is reunited with her daughter Carol, now an artist and sculptor. She also is going steady with Michael, <laughs> the richest young man in town. Can I just say, we don't use the term going steady enough anymore. No. I quite like the idea as, oh, they're going, I'm going steady. Going steady, you know? Like it's it's a way of saying you know, we we're, we're meant for each other. It's yeah. One one you know hop skip and a jump to marriage going steady. Isn't I, it? I tell everyone we're going steady. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're engaged, so very steady. Very steady. Very steady. It's so steady that there's no chance of falling over. Great. Fantastic. <laughs> Glad you write songs, but then you write uh, <laughs> jokes. <laughs> or what, what? What would you even describe that as? <laughs> Nothing. Let's forget it happened. Fab. Um, she she's horrified about the chickens being caged and the pigs not living in a tidy environment. Yeah. Animal rights activist Joan Crawford. Everyone. Carol shows Lucy around the farm and keeps putting her foot in it when referring to the inevitable slaughter of the chickens and pigs. Uh. And even when staring at chickens, Joan Crawford puts on a full performance. She does. Just, I just hate to see anything caged. Again, a farm, an axe, pigs, pearl, anyone? Ah, uh, yes, of course. Um, my favourite scene coming up next, where Carol shows Lucy a sculpture she made of her. Yes. And she has a little cry over it. Um, it's actually a real sculpture of Joe Crawford, um, created by Yuka Salomonic, uh, a Yugoslav artist, and it was originally presented to Crawford in 1941 on the set of A Woman's Face. Mm. I need to see A Woman's Face if this is what the woman's face looks like in the film. Because um, it's cunty. It is. I mean, that's what Joe Crawford looked like. It, it looks like her in The Unknown, yeah. It's, yeah. But it's so cap. It feels like it she wrote this herself. How she's unveiling the statue of pure beauty, and Joe's still like, "Oh, oh my gosh!" <laughs> it, it, I love it. I I love it, and I I think it's a very interesting scene because it plays into, um, sort of quintessential hag exploitation tropes, yeah. where the older woman is forced to see the younger version of herself. Yes, and she's pleased because she looks beautiful. But obviously, it's a reminder of the fact that she doesn't look so beautiful anymore. Mm -hmm. In the obviously, in the eyes of the she's absolutely gorgeous, but you know, in the eyes of society, she's yeah. aged, which is the most awful thing she could ever do. Um, can we talk about the elephant in the room? The fact that Carol kept the Jacqueline Wilson bracelets. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, it is that, but it's also the <laughs> fact that obviously Joan Crawford was of a certain age. Yeah. Um, if I remember correctly, because I don't think she was ever fully um, honest about her age. No. But she would have been, I believe, in her 60s mm -hmm. at the time. Um, she was obviously playing in the first scene, a woman with a three-year-old daughter. Yeah. So I feel like we were meant to believe she was in her... Twenties, yeah. At that point, uh, or thirties, mm -hmm. and then she was meant to be in her forties in these scenes. <laughs> um, it's not defined as such, but it does feel a little like, yes, um, yeah. She's maybe playing younger than she actually was mm -hmm. because when you look at this burst, that's obviously Joan Crawford when she was a lot younger. Yeah. Um, and if that's how her daughter remembered her, that's how she kind of was meant to look in the original <laughs> scene. Um, but, you know, get your screen time, Joan. Get yeah. that screen time. Lucy is reluctant to meet Michael, as everyone is a stranger to her now. I mean, quite, um, there, there are moments of actually true sort of emotion and, mm -hmm. and pathos, you know? Where she is sort of, well, everyone's a stranger to me now. You know, Carol's saying, well, Michael isn't. 
we go and study. Yeah. Said, well, I don't know. I don't know him. I've been away for twenty years. I only know the asylum. That's all I know. Uh, she runs off before dinner, and Carol and Michael find a photo album with uh, Lucy's dead husband's face cut out of all the photos. Um, she, Carol acts like it's a gift to Lucy. This photo. Yeah. Why would she give a photo album full of pictures? <laughs> because here's some photos. But why wouldn't Michael be like... Because they're like, oh no, all the heads are cut off. <laughs> why wouldn't Michael be like, well, that's a pretty inappropriate gift. You know, here's, yeah. here's a photo album full of photos of the person you <laughs> murdered. And you've literally been back less than 24 hours. Here you go. Here's a reminder of that it's murder true. you did. Uh, Carol attempts to create a bond with her mother, but Lucy's troubled by dreams and flashbacks of her horrific act. She takes Lucy on a shopping spree that includes a dress and jewellery reminiscent of the outfit she wore when she murdered her husband. Uh, again, Lucy loves her bangles. She does. She's got, she, they, does. They, she went shopping. So Carol kept the bangles. Yeah. And then they went shopping for even more fucking bangles. I love the ones that literally have bows hanging off <laughs> yes. them. Like, from this moment on, when she is unstoppable, you will not forget that she is on screen because you cannot miss her. So Lucy's returned and she's got grey hair and she's wearing a, a rather dowdy outfit. Yes. It's like, oh, it's, uh, what's, what's the collar called? Turtleneck. Turtleneck collar and, and all that jazz. And she's like, oh, well, don't you have to make a uh, appointment to go to the hairdressers? <laughs> and uh, Carol's like, no, no, not quite. We're going somewhere else. And they go to the wig shop. <laughs> and her hairstyle has been in fashion for so long that it's not just still available at the wig shop. It's in the fucking front window. This is like the Michael Myers effect. Um, because it's like in Halloween when you see the films where they start selling the Michael Myers masks mm. in the shops and stuff. Here, someone is clearly able to buy a Joan Crawford mask. Yeah. Because there's one being worn throughout the film. When, when she, and made, she made it. Because she's a sculptress. I suppose that makes more sense. Yeah. Um, but also you could buy her wig. You could dress up as a Halloween. You can dress... Yeah, you can buy that exact wig. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it kept in style for 20 years. Props to you, you know. Um, the trip to the wig shop does end rather abruptly, though, when Lucy believes that two jump roping girls are coming for her outside. Yes. Uh, she says, are you deliberately trying to embarrass me in front of a reporter? <laughs> she does say that. Of course she says that. Um, that night, Lucy hears the rhyme again and envisions lying in bed with the severed heads of her two victims. Iconic. So it's based on... Um, oh, God, what was her name? Lucy... Oh, the one that Christina Ritchie played in yeah. the film. Anyway. Lucy it's... Bordeaux, was it? Yeah, 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 something like that. Yeah, but it's it's Lucy Harbin took an axe, gave her husband 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave his girlfriend 41. Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden. There we go. I should have, yeah, should have known that, but anyway. Yeah, so um, that's the rhyme that the uh, she thinks the two girls are singing outside. She does. Not it's one, very... two, but it's coming for you. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, the way that uh, Carol says, Mother... Yeah. And with the jump rope girls, it's kind of like, oh, did Wes Craven watch this as well? Potentially, I I feel like when when we talk about um a lot of the horror films that came out in like the seventies and eighties, we we talk about in terms of influences, maybe more high profile horror mm. films, um and and the Vietnam War, you know, but. Maybe they were going out and seeing William Castle. Film. Yeah. I mean, this made $2 million. Uh-huh. Why wouldn't those directors, you know, Spielberg, Craven, Toby Hooper, George Romero, why wouldn't they have been out there watching yeah. William Castle films and being influenced by that as well mm -hmm. and, and putting it together with their sort of own ideas? Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so she... Sees these heads the in heads, bed. Yeah, they are 
given the great Yama Louis Two Swords <laughs> waxworks, <laughs> but it's iconic. They've seen better days, or they just haven't had a good day. <laughs> just the idea of Joan Crawford in bed with a full face of makeup. <laughs> yeah. Like, coming face what to do you face. Mean? Coming face to face with these <laughs> fake severed heads. Oh my god. It's. It's so camp that it kind of out camps camp. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. She also has an encounter with the farmhand, Leo Krauss, played by George Kennedy. And they have a very awkward exchange before he cuts off the head of a chicken with an axe, sending Lucy into hysterics. <laughs> and it, it pretty much throughout the whole film, anytime she sees any kind of sharp object. Yeah. Which happens to be around a lot. I mean, she's it on is. a farm, so she's going to see sharp objects more than the average person. Uh-huh. But every time she has one of those moments, those uh, face cracks. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, you're going to hear me say this a lot, but this is the first time I'm, I'm going to say it. Joan Crawford commits to this she does. role. Absolutely commits. She doesn't do it by halves. She is giving a performance. She's taking mm-hmm. this very seriously. She's like, that bitch, Betty Davis, she <laughs> got nominated. Oh, I'm going to get nominated. This yeah. is my, this is my exploitation Oscar nomination. Uh-huh. Um, and admittedly, I probably would have because it's a fantastic performance. Yeah. So uh, Lucy finally meets Michael and gets rather too close to him for Carol's comfort. Just yeah. uh, you didn't tell me he was that good looking. She gets drunk and she is trying to steal a man. Yeah, so this outfit brings some sort of side of her out <laughs> um, that no one was expecting. I feel like this is improvised. I don't even feel like this was written. I feel like this is all Joan. She's yeah. on top form again. She's putting the moves on him. Um, it's 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 fantastic. She puts her fingers in his mouth. <laughs> she does. <laughs> it is... This is how I presume Joan Crawford would flirt with a yeah. man. It's um, very Samantha Jones. It's very Samantha Jones. It's like, I can handle the socks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the thing. I just said that, you know, the heads in bed scene out camps camp. This out camps that camp in that camp scene. Like, this is just... I, this has to be the camp's moment in the film. Like, just her oh, putting the moves on. Yeah. And, it's yeah, and what it's followed by as well. Yes, honestly, it's just this is why I love camp cinema. Because Doctor Anderson, her psychiatrist, um, he comes to visit Lucy, and the encounter proves too much for her, and she experiences <laughs> a breakdown. The doctor now questions the institute's decision to release her into society. Now, fun fact. Yeah. Mitchell Cox, who plays Dr. Anderson, <laughs> was not an actor. Really? I was surprised. It, it caught me off guard as well, this little fun fact. But he was actually the vice president of public relations for the Pepsi-Cola company. <laughs> Joan Crawford had given him the role without consulting producer and director <laughs> William Castle. We've and already seen Pepsi by this point in the film. We have already seen Pepsi. Now we're seeing the... the Second face of Pepsi. The second face of Pepsi. Um, he is, I mean, yeah. Um, he is definitely acting like the vice president of public relations for the Pepsi Cola Company. He is dead. Would act in a film. Dead behind the eyes before he gets murdered. It's uh, hilarious. And the the role is much bigger and heftier than it really has any right <laughs> to be with him in the role. Than it should have been. Because he's, he's got fucking dialogue as well. He's got some real dialogue. Um, there's an iconic moment where Lucy puts on a jazz record <laughs> to distract from the Doctor's presence and then uses the record to strike her match. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is... I've seen this online a few times um, as a sort of meme or, or a gif. And they talk about how 20 years is a long time and how Lucy can't turn back the clock. It's the way she feels rather than the way she looks that's important, <laughs> despite Lucy's efforts to appear younger. Again, quintessential hag exploitation. Yeah. This woman being told that she can't turn back the clock no matter what. You are old. 
You uh-huh. are in the chair. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I all mean, that shit. But she says, when I look in the mirror, it doesn't look to me as though 20 years have passed. And I get it, Queen. I mean... Do you no, know why? Because it, it hasn't. Because this was probably filmed before the first <laughs> scene. <laughs> there was no effort whatsoever to make her appear no. at a different age, which is fine. She could get away with it. I couldn't, but she can. So mm-hmm. there we go. The Doctor now questions the Institute's decision to release her, like I said, into society. And the Doctor tells Carol about how Lucy is trying to recapture the past with the clothes and the wig. He ultimately decides that it would be best for Lucy to return to the Institution. Uh, But before he can put his plan into action, he is killed and then later found dismembered in the barn. Um, Do you think this was an influence on Friday the 13th Part 3? Probably. Everyone who walks into that barn just ends up dead. Yeah. <laughs> this is a great death scene. Mm. Um, because it doesn't pull any punches. No. This is the one, isn't it, where you see the head? No. Is it That's not? George Kennedy. Oh, I thought it this was. This one doesn't either. This uh, No, this one actually probably does a little more. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, the one coming uh, up. But, the um, one coming up, yeah. Her breakdown as well is great when she storms out. Who told you about my dreams? Who told you about my nightmares? No, leave me alone. <laughs> and he's just there, like, just standing there, dead behind the eyes, bless him. No idea what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Uh, Lucy speaks to Carol about how the clothes and the wig are making her behave irrationally. Uh, she's decided to keep her hair grey and focus more on her knitting. <laughs> <laughs> Just like society tells us. It's what should. society would want from her, <laughs> definitely. Uh, both Karen and Lucy fear that Lucy was probably the one who chopped up the doctor after her body's, <laughs> his body's discovered uh, during one of her traumatic flashbacks. Carol hides the doctor's car, but is seen by Leo, who blackmails her. A short time later, Leo is decapitated in the barn. So a very yeah. small role for George Kennedy. But this is where we see an actual yeah. decapitation. It's so good. It's so good. I mean, we're not we're not getting blood splatters. It is very... Um, how would you describe it? Sort of, if you went to a visit to the London Dungeon yeah. and they put on like a little hokey little show. Yeah. Um, but it looks great. It's fantastic. And I was shocked. I mean, this was the first time I watched it. This was a 12. Mm. You know, I'd seen decapitations, but there was a silhouette against the wall. I was like, okay, you know, this isn't what the film's about. Um, you know, it, it's from 1964. So we're, we're not going to see an actual decapitation, which is fine. And then it's like, whoop, off of his head. Yeah. Like iconic, iconic death scene. So one evening, Lucy and Carol visit Michael and his parents for dinner, and it is not a happy affair. Lucy is reluctant to go, nervous she would embarrass herself again because she's wearing the dress. Yeah, she's wearing the bangles, she's wearing the wig. <laughs> yes, um, she's also forced to wear them, and that always spells disaster. Mm-hmm. She's doing it for Carol. Carol yeah. kind of emotionally blackmails her mm-hmm. into putting on this outfit again and all that business please so, mama slay for me please <laughs> in a fantastic scene which shows a lot of um sort of directing prowess from william castle he was a fantastic director but people may not think he is the most stylish director we have a scene where lucy hallucinates or she thinks she's hallucinating or she believes that she's trapped in a glamorous cell. Yes. Because it's got stripy walls and a vanity table. Mm-hmm. And she thinks that she's back in a, like a padded room. Yeah. Um, and we have this shot from above. Yeah. And Joan is, of course, putting on a performance for us. Um, but I think it looks fantastic. It does. Like, really great shot. And it's revealed that it, it's there is a door there and... Carol opens the door and she's only in this room. Whatever this kind of room is, I, I, I don't really know. Um, would you call it like a powder room or, or something? Or yeah. Just a room where um, ladies uh, powder their nose and get ready. Um, but it turns out she's spilt coffee on her dress and 
uh, Carol was getting the, the stains out. Mm-hmm. But I thought this was fantastic. Oh, yeah. I thought this was yeah, looks so a good. real bit of horror. I mean, yeah. akin to something like Repulsion. Yeah. You know, really great. Um, Michael's mother believes Carol is unfit to marry her precious boy. And she has no qualms in saying she so. Does not. She, she's, at least she's honest. In a rage, Lucy storms out of the house, pursued by Carol and Michael, leaving Michael's parents alone in their home. And again, Joan gives us a fucking performance. She does. She does. Absolute performance. She basically says, my girl's going to get what she wants out of this life. I was cheated. She won't be. Mm-hmm. A real emotional yeah. performance by someone who has been, you know, screwed over in life. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it's, I really, I, I do enjoy how much she commands the screen during all these scenes. Like, all these big monologue moments in a B movie, a yeah. B movie film about someone who's an, an exploitation film about an axe murderer. You yeah. know, it's they, there's no reason for her performance to be this good, but it is, and, and in, I'm living for it. In the documentary that we watched, there, there seemed to be a confusion between what was B movie and A movie. Mm. So obviously, Joan Crawford, one of the biggest stars of all time, A movie. William yeah. Castle, the king of the B movie, uh-huh. and so it's and you get that with how exploitation because of these women who are forced into starring in B movies yeah. as they're aging, you get this sort of A list status in a B list movie. You know, whatever happened to Baby Jane was never meant to be the huge box office success that it was. Mm-hmm. Um, it was seen very much as a B movie, and then it's getting Oscar nominations and and all that business. Um, so it, it's for me, it incorporates so much that I love, like classic Hollywood and B movies, and brings yeah. them together. So it's one of my absolute favorite genres. Yes, a lot of it is based purely on misogyny, and we can look back now and and point that out and say, well, no, you know that that's not right. But I can also say, but it's fucking entertaining. Yes. And, and we can look at it from that perspective. Uh-huh. Um, so later, while in his closet, Michael's father is butchered. Michael's mum is subsequently confronted by the killer. as She has a little search. She's uh, making up a little bit of time when she's searching the bathroom and there's someone behind the shower curtain. Uh-huh. I think maybe a little reference to uh, yes. Robert Block's previous work. There's a room. Yeah. There is a room with a lot of taxidermy in it. Yes. Um, in one scene as well. There's definitely a few psycho references thrown in. Absolutely. Um, so Michael's mum is subsequently confronted by the killer who is wearing a latex mask that resembles Lucy's face. Yeah. I was gagged the first time I watched this <laughs> because... You don't expect it. Now, watching it back, it's like, okay, little things here and there. It's kind of like, well, it does yeah. make sense. But you're sure you've seen Joan Crawford doing these murders. Yes. It's her outfit. It's yeah. her wig. You know, of course it's her. Uh, so when it happens, I was like, oh, fuck. I actually really did not see that coming the first time I watched it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it looks great. It does. It's <laughs> I actually do think dick- it looks it's, great. It's kind of horrifying. Um, I mean... Everything on there is accurate with the makeup <laughs> yeah. and yeah. She's wearing the bangles. Yes. She She's is. got the whole outfit on. Because then Lucy herself enters for the big reveal, having returned to the house. Lucy then fights and subdues the killer. The battle of the bangles. Oh, That's all you can hear. Oh my god. Joan Crawford wrestling <laughs> with herself. It's absolutely what's that uh is it the spider what man? Mean when they're pointing yeah, at each other, yeah. like, you. Uh, they're fighting on the bed, and she removes the mask, and it's revealed to be Carol. Yeah. Carol was the murderer. Yeah. She was dressing up like her mother and killing these people and making poor Lucy. Although, <laughs> although we do, must remember that Lucy did actually murder people. Like, yes, she was cheated on. I do understand I that. I say, get it, girl. But... Go for it. <laughs> We're talking films here, so it doesn't have to be realistic, and I am fully rooting for her. I think Lee Why Majors you never did cheat at all. Lee Majors deserved it. The little bitch he was cheating with deserved it. Um, hey, so... he might not have known that she was. She might have known. Might not have known that he was married. Yeah, just ignore the kid on your way in. That is a bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That is. Yeah. Let's not get into that. 
Um, she admits to the killings having been motivated by greed. Carol had hoped to murder Michael's parents and frame Lucy, enabling her to marry Michael and get his riches, I assume. Yeah. Um, she has a uh, breakdown. She says, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. No, I didn't mean that. I love you. I hate you. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I love it. 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 Um, the scene where you're only supposed to see her, or so she thought. This is Diane Baker. She knew that this was her moment. She was revealed to be the killer. She's having her uh, emotional breakdown. Uh, this is the end of the film. Everything's come to a conclusion. Also, Diane Baker thought. <laughs> because what we also get is Lucy outside having <laughs> her own breakdown. What's hugging a pillar. Hugging a pillar. Joan Crawford again, putting on a performance, <laughs> putting on a show. Um, she, Diane Baker noted in the making of the documentary that this breakdown outside the door wasn't in the original script, but unsurprisingly, let's be fair. Neither was the finale. No. Joan Crawford didn't want the drama to end under <laughs> Baker's face. No. No, she didn't. Because it's her film. She's on the poster. People are going to see a Joan Crawford picture. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we get an additional scene after that as well. We also do. Because uh, in the film's final scene, the now magically sane <laughs> Lucy. <laughs> I love how adding the trauma on top of everything else. like The trauma of her daughter <laughs> pretending to be her and murdering people. Like... If anything, that might be somewhat more traumatic than the original murder. Yes, yeah. it's. Like... But anyway, apparently that cured her. You know, it two two wrongs her. apparently do make a right, and she's preparing to visit Carol in the same psychiatric hospital where she was once confined. It's very psycho esque. It's very much the little roundup at the end. It's with the psychology. Yeah. It's also painful how much she's desperately trying to end the film on her being a protagonist. Yes. Like, I can help her now. I and we get the big classic Hollywood score like we're watching yes. our hero. <laughs> um, yeah, apparently Carol set up the whole thing, absolutely everything. The heads in the bed were set up. Yeah. The sound of the children singing about her was also set up. The photo album was set up completely by Carol. Um, yeah, it was all her from start to finish. Yeah. And we end the film on the Columbia picture symbol, the lady with the torch, without a head. Yes. Stand at her feet. I love it. I love it. It's, it's pure William Castle. Uh, what a way, what great. What a great way yeah. to end the film. Definitely. It's iconic. And that that straight jacket. Yes. Um, the height of camp. The height of camp. William Castle does this perfectly. Yeah. It's perfect B movie. Mm -hmm. But the reason we're watching this is Joan Crawford. Yeah. That performance is up there with some of the best. Because she fully commits. And when everything else is so fucking ridiculous mm -hmm. and so over the top B movie, and Joan Crawford thinks she's still in fucking Mildred Pierce, uh -huh. it's all oh, perfection. It is. It is. It's amazing. I, yeah, one of my favourite William Castle films. It's definitely up there in his top five. Easily. Definitely. Definitely. I, I highly recommend. If if you believe you have similar taste to us after listening, um, I hope you've already watched it because we've just spoiled mm -hmm. the whole fucking thing. Yeah. But if you haven't, I really highly recommend watching yeah. it. it. It's pretty much how I would describe my taste in yeah. films. <laughs> Definitely. Should we give it some awards? Yes. Biggest queen. It's got to be Lucy. It's Lucy. Definitely. Um... Yeah, lead singer of the Bangles. Yeah. Old Lucy. <laughs> Good old Lucy. She's having a manic Monday. She is. <laughs> she is. Um, <laughs> biggest gasp, I give it to the big reveal with Carol in the Joan mask. I went with uh, an actual decapitation in a 12. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, George Kennedy's head going flying <laughs> was uh, quite a shocker. Best dialogue, I am very much a woman. I'm very much aware of the fact. <laughs> Absolutely.
There's no doubt. That is definitely the best dialogue. And that's camp. Uh, there's a lot of choices, but I give it to Lucy getting drunk and trying to seduce her daughter's boyfriend. <laughs> so many to choose from, like Gary said, but I went with the two Jones at the end. An all-time classic, <laughs> fighting each other. Yeah, um, camp heaven. Ratings, I give it 10 Jacqueline Wilson bracelets out of 10. I give it 10 cases of over-accessorising out of 10. And uh, Masterpiece, Trash Piece, Trash, basically a camp or a bunch of fun. The second week in a row, it's a camp or a bunch of Masterpiece. It's a camp or a bunch of Masterpiece. Uh, it's available on Blu-ray and Video On Demand. And if you enjoyed this, I've got two recommendations I think you should check out. Pearl, obviously, and Nightmares in a Damaged Brain. Yes, great choices there. Um, I went with three. Uh, if you enjoyed this, check out Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, Psycho 2, and Homicidal. Yeah. Three fan fucking tastic films. Mm-hmm. Five fantastic films yeah. to recommend there. And we are Horror Court Trash over on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Horror Court Trash on Twitter. I'm Dead at Gaz92 on Letterboxd, Gazmo205 on Instagram, and GazCruz92 on Twitter. I'm Chris Barker823 on Instagram and Letterboxd. And we are also GasporaFest across all social media as well. We are getting even closer now. It is next month. Go get your tickets. Give us a rate review, subscribe on iTunes, like and follow on everything else. Next week, uh, Hagsploitation continues with a bit of modern Hagsploitation. When we'll be discussing X. X. Yes. Discussing uh, Maxine herself before Maxine was released. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So we're back same time, same place next week. Bye.